The Trump administration is facing new questions about the Russia investigation. The president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, is at the center of the controversy for discussing the possibility of establishing secret communications with the Kremlin before Trump took office. It's just the latest crisis engulfing the White House since President Trump took office. I'm joined now by Rick Davis, a Republican strategist and former campaign manager for John McCain's presidential bid. Rick, great to see you. So Fine. much Good to, see you again. to get to. First of all, let's talk about these latest revelations on Russia. There is, it seems, this daily drip, 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 near daily drip, drip, drip of news. What do you make of these latest revelations? You know, look, I do think it's just part of the exposing narrative. As it goes along, you turn a page every day and there's some new story. And I think this is the thing that the Trump administration has failed to do is to be able to get ahead of it, right? Just lay it all out there. Get it out in the public domain so that we're not learning about something new every day because of course you know the american public and the media especially is very salacious they love to hear something new every day it's great reporting it drives all this press <laughs> and uh... and and they feed right into it right mm -hmm. and so instead of having this very transparent let's get it all out let's manage the story let's put our own definition on it it's totally defensive and they can't expect anything else, right? Today's uh, defense was, it's all fake news again. And, you know, some of it probably is inaccurate. Doesn't necessarily mean it's fake news. No one's generating this news to be untrue. But if you don't put out your version of the facts, then how do you expect the media to cover something other than what they get from unnamed sources, you know, or, you know, hearsay that they might be picking up, some of which may be true, some of which may not be. So now it looks like they're going to be actually trying to do some of that with this war room, where they're going to be pushing back against some of the narrative. Good idea? Well, it's one thing to be defensive again and push back against the narrative that the media is creating because of the drip, drip, drip that they're getting. Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to get it all out, right? I mean, the concept of disclosure would be to say, you know what, we've done our own internal investigation. We've asked everybody to cooperate and we've now come up with this. And they have a narrative that says, sure, there was all these contacts, sure, there was all this self-dealing, sure, all this stuff happened, and other than a few people who made a couple bucks, the rest of it's pretty innocent, we're moving on. Mm -hmm. Now, until they get to that point, they're not on offense. So if they want a war room and play defense and counterattack whenever the press puts something out that they want to challenge, that's just gonna tie them up. Mm -hmm. But I don't see any evidence that they want to actually create any level of independence, have someone take a look at this from the inside out, and then put it out there in the public domain with their own version of the narrative around it. It's an interesting idea that you mentioned, but wouldn't it be seen as being sort of too little too late if they were to do something like that at this point? Well, you talk about what options do they have, mm -hmm. right? When you take a step back, you know, and you say, okay, this is all miserable, right? It's, it, there are no good options on the table. You're sitting around the White House and every morning you're picking up the papers. Every two hours you get another tweet. Every you know couple of minutes you get a, a, a new story on the web and, and, it, and you're consumed by it, right? You, they call it a bunker mentality for a reason. You know, you put up all the defenses around the White House and say, we don't even want anybody coming over here right now. And, and you talk to yourselves, right? They're all meeting in various offices saying, you know, how do we handle this? And, and so unless you take sort of the liberal view and you say, you know what, set everything down, pencils down, let's take another look at this. How do we get out of this thing? There's going to be, and there is, a you know, special prosecutor and he's gonna do his job. That could be a year from now or longer. So what do we do in the interim? Well, in the interim, we have to get past this. We can't just play defense every day. It would incapacitate the administration from getting anything done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why not do what other administrations have done? When Ronald Reagan had Iran-Contra, he brought in a group of people. He said, you have access to everybody and everything, and they produced a report. Now, it took a while for everybody else's investigations to filter in, but you know what? Their report basically was an accurate portrayal of what happened. They had to take a couple hits, right? It wasn't very good that intelligence agencies were trading guns for, you know, drugs. and. And so, you know, you had to take the hit that wrong things have been done. But once you did that, 
it didn't incapacitate the rest of the administration. I mean, people went on with their business. So, and that's really what they're trying to get to now. I so think. in the absence of that, what's happening to the president's political capital? What's happening to the political capital of Republicans who are looking at things like health care reform, who are looking at tax reform potentially, right. and not seeing any way to move? Yeah, when, it, when the White House goes to the Hill and says, we need you today to be going out and defending Jared Kirshner, mm -hmm. they're not going to the Hill and saying, we need today a good tax plan. Right. I mean, so so it just crowds the message. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you're then focused on that defensive uh, bunker mentality, how do you get outside of that and start holding Hill meetings without actually having to answer all those questions from the members? Because remember, the members are getting these phone calls from the media and their constituents, their donors and their their they're the folks who put them in office saying, what the heck is going on in Washington? Yeah. So they're not getting at the town hall, what have we done about ACA? What have we done about taxes? What are we doing about the budget? I mean, we have in September uh, the budget coming to a conclusion again. We only have a continuing resolution that lasts till September. There is no action on appropriations bills at this point. I think 18 need to be passed. And then that has to be in reconciliation with the House. And all that's got to be done by September, and there's no effort toward getting that done. After promises were made that we're going to go to regular order on the budget and actually get a budget for the first time in five years. So what does that say? What does that tell us about Republicans? What does it tell us about the president? Look, I think we're entering a crisis period, right? You, you, you always wonder, is this a circus or a crisis? I would say for months I would have pegged it as a circus, right? Because mostly revolved around uh, sort of everyday tweets and, 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 and sort of recriminations from the campaign. And that was entertainment more than it was getting in the way. And then there was still activity on Capitol Hill toward reforming the health care legislation and trying to get something done. I would say now it's a crisis where nothing is getting done. Um, efforts on Capitol Hill uh, toward taxes are, are immobilized because they can't figure out what kind of revenue they're going to need because they can't get a fix on whether or not there's going to be health care, which has a big slug of revenue associated with it. There's no consensus amongst the Republicans on Capitol Hill, how deeply to cut taxes in order to be able to, to create relief. Um, I would say it's, 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 it's a bit of an impasse. Maybe it would have been that way anyway, because Republicans have a hard time agreeing on things these days. But this is now a reason that you're going to be using as an excuse to say this is why nothing's getting done. So it's interesting. Vice President Mike Pence will stump this summer for midterm elections. What role uh, can the VP play here? And what should we infer from the fact that he's the one that's going out on the trail? Yeah. I think that um, there, there's obviously a decision that's been made, right? Because when you look at the VP, he's particularly good on Capitol Hill. These members like him. He did a lot of that uh, lobbying for the administration when the um, debate was going on on health care, and he was very effective about that. Um, I would say he would be the number one guy that you would dispatch to the Hill to sort of break the log jam on taxes, get the budget mechanisms going on, sell the president's budget. None of that's being done. So a decision has obviously been made that it's more important to try and salvage these House seats uh, and dispatch him into the campaign cycle, which is still very early in that process. But you got to think, wow, a normal party in power uh, uh, in an off-year election, first off-year election, loses 36 seats. We have 24-seat margin. And that's the average. Is this administration clocking in above or below average? Mm, interesting. Republican strategist Rick Davis, so great to see you again. Great to see you, Ellen. Thanks so much.